crónicas da Shoas. I know the weather would have kept most of our students back from being here this morning, but we would have tried our best to wait as long as possible. And at this time, we are going to begin. All right? Are you all excited? I, I wonder. I I'm not getting the excitement. Are you all excited for today? All right. Dr. Colwick Wilson, Dr. Len Archer, Dr. Samuel Sheffy, Dr. Edward Clark, Dean of Social Sciences, chairs, faculty, staff, specially invited guests, representative from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, and St. Anne Psychiatric Hospital, and our special students, good morning. I am so happy to see you this morning. And I'm excited because you all have taken the time to take a stand to represent and show your support in bringing awareness to mental health. Now, I am Usha Ramlakan, the Master of Ceremony for the Social Sciences Department, as we promote the initiative World Mental Health Day 2022. Now, the theme for this year is Make Mental Health and Well-Being for All a Global Priority. Now, mental health problems exist in our lives. It exists in our families. It exists in our workplaces. It exists in our schools. It exists in our communities. And it impacts everyone. It impacts whom? Everyone. It impacts you and it impacts me. Now, we need to do as much as possible to prevent mental ill health. And as individuals and as a university, we are taking a stand today to say and to represent and to bring awareness, to speak about it, to say no, to say that we support you, to say that it is okay to speak about your mental health. It is okay to talk about it because if you turn to the person next to you, do you see if they are struggling with their mental health? Can you recognize that? No, Nasha, no. <laughs> Can you see if they are struggling with their mental health? Mental ill health do not have a face, which means that the person next to you could be struggling with their mental health. And so my advice to you today is to be kind always. Be kind because you do not know if the person next to you is struggling with their mental health. And today we are going to try to bring awareness to a World Mental Health Day. It's an opportunity for us as a university to collectively bring awareness to mental health. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and look at them and say to them, your mental health is a priority. Your mental health is a priority. Your mental health is a priority. And so the order of our program, the order for, of our program for today will begin with opening prayer by Mrs. Anne Apaka. She's a lecturer at the University of the Southern Caribbean, which we followed by the Dean of Social Sciences, Dr. Edward Clark, who would welcome us officially as we begin the program. And he would also introduce our president, who would then bring greetings to us. So sit back and relax as we officially start the morning's proceedings with prayer. Morning all. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for even this 
program, mental health and wellness. We pray, Lord, that you will use all the speakers to minister to us, to help us to learn, understand, and appreciate who we are, and help us to learn how to deal with our issues in a positive manner. Father, we ask that you bless each and every one of us, and let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're feeling welcome. Well, look, with all the masks on, I can't even see your smile. But I'm sure you're happy to be here. Well, we are happy you're here because we spent some time planning this occasion. And it's all for you. So I hope that you will be able to um, enjoy it. Uh, what we have planned for you. Now, Mental Health Day. Now, as you're aware, the official Mental Health Day is on the 10th of October. But because of various challenges, and most of all, we wanted to get the of uh, many officials to come to our function, we had to change the day slightly. So if you are saying to yourself, well, as far as I'm concerned, Mental Health Day is on the 10th of October, don't worry, we are not changing the date. We are just here to let you know that we acknowledge it, we are happy to be associated with it, but we are celebrating it today. All right, and um, I just want to let you know that mental health is wealth. Could you say it? Mental health is wealth. Do you believe that? Yes. It is definitely the case. You know, sometimes our wealth is very overt, very visible. We can see the Porsche you drive, or the Mercedes, or the Toyota, and the house you live in. So your wealth is, wealth is very obvious. But then there is a body of wealth that we very seldom see it's in our assets. And you don't know another person's assets. And it's those assets that come into play when they are needed. And that's when you're under pressure, when you need to deal with stressful situations, and that's where your mental health becomes your wealth. And I really would like to promote that um, concept of mental health as wealth. It's your hidden asset. So it's very important that we promote um, mental wealth as mental health. Now, mental health has come a long ways um, since the late 60s when I became involved in mental health. In those days, we were mainly concerned with treating mental health illness. So I've had a long association with mental um, issues, and it was the stigma associated with mental illness concept that prompted me in 1998 to do my PhD thesis on the topic of mental ill health. So way back in 1988, I thought what I was seeing in the hospital as mental illness I thought, no, I, I think there's a different way of looking at this, and that was mental health. So that was the way of my defining a new way of looking at what we were describing as mental illness, but that's a long time ago. So today, we are more self-aware and sensitive about the importance of mental health. And this attitude has changed things for the better. I remember the 60s, all, if you go to England today, all those big mental institutions that dotted the countryside are no more. We've got rid of them. Um, and, and I'm sure if you've kept a pace of what's happened in Trinidad, that's one of the things that the ministry wants to do. It wants to divest themselves 
of these institutions that we have that we call mental hospitals. Because we tend to associate a lot of stigma with these institutions. So our language surrounding mental health has improved as words like crazy and lunatic and mad are used less flippantly and we come to better understand that they can be unintentionally hurtful and stigmatizing. So while we have learned a lot, there's still so much we can do to evolve as a society. So today, we are making a small step to create awareness of mental ill health and to create awareness that we all experience mental ill health at some point in time in our lives. And we are still here saying we are not hospitalized. Thank goodness for that. Just imagine if we were able to put a thermometer and test your mental health and then you discovered that you were unhealthy. How many people would be hospitalized? Including myself. Okay. So we are delighted that you're here. And I know that as you sit and listen, you will hear and experience some truths and you will leave here well informed on mental health. I thank you. Something to be thankful for today, right? We all have our mental health intact, right? Yeah? So I, I want to welcome on stage the chair for the social, um, not chair, sorry, I apologize, Dr. Glenda Hinkson, yes, chair for social work department. Now, she will introduce the president who will bring greetings, but I just want to say a few words on Glenda. Glenda is such a hardworking individual. She has her, she, she, you look at her and you would think she's serious but she makes work fun. You know, she has fun while she's working, which is good for your mental health. That's the point I'm making. You have fun while working, while doing the hard stuff, because it encourages you to be happy, to be healthy. It promotes mental health. And so I want you to welcome Dr. Glenda Hickson, the chair for the social work department. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Colwick Mervyn Wilson was appointed as the 29th president of the, of the University of the Southern Caribbean, USC, as of July 1st, 2021. Dr. Wilson, an alumnus of Caribbean Union College, now USC, is of Guyanese heritage. His career journey has honed for him an impressive vita of academic and administrative experience and professional renown. Dr. Wilson obtained a Bachelor of Arts, Honors, degree in theology from Caribbean Union College, a Master of Arts in Sociology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, a Master of Arts degree in Leadership and Counseling, Eastern Michigan University in Yips Ypsilanti, Michigan, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Sociology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Wilson previously served as Provost and Senior Vice President at Oakwood University, Alabama. Before his appointment at Oakwood University, he also served in leadership and academic roles at Loma Linda University, California, and the Ohio location of Kettering Health Network. He also possesses non-denominational academic experience and served as an associate professor at the University of Michigan. An ardent researcher, Dr. Wilson published work, appears in several peer-reviewed journals, and he has been active as a presenter and participant on the academic conference circuit, particularly in the areas of social and health sciences. Dr. Wilson is also experienced in successful proposal and grant writing, and has served as a principal investigator for single and interdisciplinary grant awards. Dr. Wilson is a visionary 
innovative and collaborative leader with an extremely engaging personality. He is a consummate professional and places premium value on the spiritual well-being of the people he leads and interacts with. This is not at all surprising since his earliest academic degree was in the field of theology. And in the nascent phases of his career, he has served as a pastor, a calling he has not since relinquished. Dr. Wilson is married to Dr. Lee, to Dr. Delise Cole Wilson, and they have two adult daughters, Chidima and Corlys. Dr. Wilson. Uh, Dr. Samuel Shafay, Senior Medical Officer, St. Anne's Hospital, Northwest Regional Health Authority, Mrs. Ashvini Nath, Manager, Mental Health Unit, Ministry of Health, Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago, and Mrs. Irma Bailey Riaz from the Ministry of Education. Uh, Dr. Len Archer, Provost, uh, University of the Southern Caribbean. Dr. Edward Clark, Dean of the School of Social Sciences. Faculty, staff, special invited guests, or students uh, from our CUC. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We have compelling evidence that poor mental health has profound negative impact on a host of acute and chronic outcomes, such as one's emotional, behavioral, cognitive, social, and importantly for me, relational health and well-being, our coping mechanisms, and our physical health. We know that poor mental health is both a cause and a consequence of poverty, compromised education, gender inequality, ill health, violence, and other global challenges that we face. This powerful bidirectional impact of poor mental health hinders one's capacity to thrive and in a specific way uh, to work productively. As such, we know that depression is the leading cause of years lost due to disability worldwide. Mental health problems, including alcohol abuse, are among the 10 leading causes of disability in both the de developed world and the so-called underdeveloped world. In particular, depression is ranked third in the global burden of disease and is projected to rank first in 2020, 2030. Before the pandemic, one article published in 2019 documented and provided reliable estimates that indicated that globally, on an average, one in eight individuals was living with a mental disorder. Uh, during the first year of COVID-19, the estimate rose uh, to over 25% to what it was, especially in the context of anxiety and depression. It is an understatement to observe that while COVID-19 resulted in an alarming increase in mental health disorders and related problems, that mental health remains a vexing challenge uh, to health professionals and uh, to the global community at large. We still think of mental health as something that is deviant in its source and in its outcomes. 
The fact is that we have been struggling with the stigma associated with mental health to the extent that we find ourselves at a nexus where we have to deal with the fact that mental health, while it's directly correlated with our physical health, is seen as an unimportant and unnecessary challenge that people face. Now, China Mills' work, however, summarizes what I would say is an important trajectory that is usually under the radar in terms of mental health globally. And in her work, she, she mentioned that concern over the historical absence of mental health from the development agenda, parenthetically, despite it being regarded as a major obstacle to development, has led to its recent inclusion in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In, in, in her article, she, she makes a point that there are three interesting nexuses where, where these developmental goals of the U United Nations and mental health converge. One, the conceptualization and calculation of the contribution of mental disorder to the global burden of disease, as I indicated earlier. Two, the quantification of mental disorder as an economic burden to our society. And three, the relationship between mental distress and poverty. Last month, within the World Health Organization, they provided guidelines on mental health in the workplace. And I quote from their summary of those, those guidelines. The, the article makes a point that for a large proportion of the global population, mental health and work are intertwined in terms of mental health being more than the absence of mental health conditions. And rather, as we are familiar with, mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, to realize their abilities to learn well and work well and to contribute to their communities. In the face of mental health, we have two elements, I think, that are well known in the mental health literature. One, exposure to chronic stress. And two, the availability and use of adequate resources to help one cope with this, this exposure. The deferential impact of stress on people's health and well-being is buffeted by resources uh, that we have that makes these outcomes what they are. I want to focus, as I conclude, on one of those additional stressors, and that is COVID-19. I want you to know that while you may think that the pandemic is over, that the impact of COVID-19 continues and will for a long time, not only in terms of long COVID and its physical impact, but the mental health challenges that will emerge over time as a result of COVID-19. So what do we do in the face of these mental health challenges? I say we, we load up on the resources we have, and just one resource I want to highlight. There are many of them. That is the impact of forgiveness on our health and well-being. There are four areas in the research of forgiveness. Feeling forgiven by God, forgiving others, seeking forgiveness, and importantly, forgiving oneself. We have found that self-forgiveness is the single more, most popular, popular and powerful has the most singular and popular impact on our health and well-being. Not necessarily feeling forgiven by God, even though all of those measures are important, but the way we think of ourselves, the way we treat ourselves. I would suggest to us that as we go through this period of our lives, that we seek to benefit from that resource. So I'm grateful for all of you who came today. 
I'm grateful for those who planned and organized this event. It's amazing that we have professionals on this campus who are concerned about our health and well-being, and especially our mental health. I can't wait to hear our keynote speaker, and so let me get out of the way so that that can happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for those wonderful words of encouragement as it relates to mental health. Our president is an advocate for mental health, and I can, I'm going to take an opportunity to predict that in the near future, our schedule may have a day designated for World Mental Health Day. What do you think? Yes. Yeah? So moving forward on our schedule, we will see World Mental Health Day. That entire day is going to be dedicated to World Mental Health, right? Right? All right. At this point in time, I want to invite our provost, Dr. Len Archer. He's the interim provost for the University of the Southern Caribbean. He comes with a wealth of experience. He's a native of our beautiful island, Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to welcome him on stage as he brings to us greetings. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to recognize all the guests here, and uh, rather than going through all the names, we have heard them uh, before, so a courtesy is extended. But I want to uh, uh, highlight one individual, and that's our main speaker. We want to welcome uh, Dr. Shafi here with us today. It is a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to, uh, to join with you in acknowledging this very, very important day. Now, uh, our moderator indicated that uh, it was, we were, oh, I don't think it was a moderator, someone indicated, anyway, that we were doing this early. Uh, Mental Health Day is actually on the 10th of October. Well, I think that's pretty, uh, that's probably a good thing. Now you have an entire week to continue to think about all that's being said here. And, and to also uh, think about the Mental Health Day. But I come to you as a layman. I am not a social scientist, as our, our esteemed president is. And uh, for many of us, we don't quite understand all the detail, and we don't have all the, the statistics and the numbers that, that you will hear from some of our speakers. And I think for us, therefore, the emphasis of Mental Health Day is demonstrated by our reflection of our society. We know that our society is in many ways a violent society. Uh, you just have to pick up the newspapers and see what's going on around us. And the violence reflected in our society is certainly a result of the mental health challenges that many of us face, many of our colleagues, our children, parents. The difficulty of children uh, coping with mental health issues is also demonstrated, as our president uh, highlighted a minute ago, on the experiences over the last two years. Uh, COVID has exacerbated the wounds that exist, opened them in some way. The statistics do indicate that the suicide rate dramatically increased over the last two years, particularly among teenagers, but also among adults, trying to cope with all the events that have occurred over the, that period of time. And in many ways, the issues remain buried in our society. You know, we come from a generation where we were told to grin and bear it. No matter what it was, we were supposed to just suck, up, suck it up and move on. Don't talk about it, despite the experiences we have faced. And so this opportunity today to highlight Mental Health Day, and mental health in particular, is a very important one. So you don't have to be soft and suffer alone you can speak with the people who can help you. You can talk about yourselves. 
and thankfully, we're moving more towards that than we have been in the past. I love sports. Um, having spent a number of years in the United States, I grew to, to like one of the more violent uh, sports, um, football, American football. I, I, I heard a shout there, amen. Well, the kind of macho attitude that football brings. Now we are looking very critically at some of the physical aspects of playing football. You hear a lot about CTE. We know a lot of retired players are not only dying much younger because of their brain injuries, but are also suffering uh, mental impair impairment that has moved not just from the, from the physical, but the psychological. Uh, there's an increased number of suicides among some of those people. But also, what is good is that over the last few years, particularly during and after COVID, and those of you who follow cricket, I'm also a cricket fan, we know that many of our, our, our players have asked for a mental break, a mental break from playing. Uh, the isolation that has, that has uh, uh, been the, with COVID, uh, playing in the bubble, all these things have contributed to the need for a closer look on mental health. So from my layman's point of view, as much as I want to see my uh, players on the field, I'm also cognizant of the fact that we all, whether you play football, whether you're a sports person, whether you're just a fan, or whether you're just another person doing the, your day-to-day -day activities, we all occasionally need a mental health break. There are a few states in the United States that now have laws on the books that allow their workers to take a mental health day as part of their official leave, paid leave for mental health. Some of you will perhaps be glad to hear that. Today is not the day, though, to take a mental break, I may warn you. So without extending my, my discourse here, I just want to congratulate the School of uh, Social Sciences for putting this together. I think it's very, very important. I do support Mr. Ramlakan's proposal that it be included on the calendar, Mr. President. And, uh, and, and I really hope that it makes a difference, not only to you as professionals in the field, uh, students, but every one of us, that this event does create the impetus for making mental health a very important part of our society. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asher. And I do want to also, in agreement with him, say to you that as you use cricket and football as an analogy, you know, most of us, we would play cricket. We'd recently had some major games and whatnot. And when people, when, when the balls of life are bold to you, and it is stress and it is anxiety, I want you to, do, to, to, to hit it for six. Don't allow yourself to get clean bowled, but hit it for six and defend yourself. But do we have any cricket fans in here? Yeah, yeah we do? Great. So the next time someone bowl at you a ball of stress, a ball of anxiety, you are to what? Hit it for six. All right. So at this time, we're going to have a short drama presentation. And this drama presentation is going to depict our theme, making mental health and well-being a global priority. It's a short presentation, so sit back, relax, and enjoy it. So, y'all heard the news? What news? 
Dog, G, I'm not coming back to school. Well, at least not for a long time, you know. That's how you mean she's not coming back for a long time. Like, as in, I heard she kind of going a little crazy. Well, not mad mad, but... No, you sure? Make some sense. How you mean mad mad? I always know she was weird, and she always used to be moving moody every time she around me and them. Dog, you remember when she couldn't finish her labs and thing, and she was like, <laughs> she was taking so long to do this one lab. I'm like, that's very crazy. You thought that was strange? What about how she began avoiding us and stuff? She, normally, she was the life of the party. And then all of a sudden, it's like she don't want to be our friend anymore. I'm listening to the two of you. And the girl is not mad, the girl not weird. Her behavior could all be summed up to the fact that she has mental health problems. We do not know what it was and made fun of what, we've, what should be serious. What do you mean mental health issues? Normally when they say they have mental health issues, it's because you're mad or no? No, guys, sir. You know what? Let me look that up because I don't want to give you all false information. True. So let me real check myself there. We refer to a person's mental health. It refers to their emotions, their psychological mm -hmm. and social well-being. It affects how a person thinks and how a person feels, how they act. It also helps determine how they handle stress, other issues, and how they make choices. It is more than an abuse of mental disorder, an absence of mental disorders. It is a state of well-being that, en that enables a person to cope with life stresses, realize their abilities, work well, and contribute to their communities. Over the course of your life, if you experience mental health problems, thinking, your mood, and your behavior could be affected. Many factors contribute to mental health problems, and I feel like you can read that, right? Because yeah, I'm not real fine. What we're looking at? We're looking at Google. Okay. But what else we going? Of course, it's Google, but right. Google have the answers. You seen it there? Go yeah. Ahead. Right, well, I'll just read that because okay. I, I not see right. it. So there are biological factors such as genes or brain chemistry, life experiences such as trauma or abuse, family history or mental health problems, psychological or biological factors such as emotional skills, substance use, and genetics can make people more vulnerable to mental health problems. It is stated there that an early warning signs could tell if having mental challenges could probably be sleep or appetite changes, eating or sleeping too much or little, withdrawal, pulling away from people and usually activities, loss of interest or activities, problems thinking and problems with memory concentration or logical thought, forgetfulness. Increased sensitivity, heightened sensitivity to sight, songs, smell, or touch. Decline in having personal care, having low or no energy, feeling numb or like nothing matters. Feeling helpless or hopeless, yelling or fighting with family and friends. Experiencing severe mood swings that cause problems in relationships. Having persistent thoughts and memories you can get out of your head. Hearing voices or believing that things are not true, thinking of harmful things to do to yourself or others, and inability to perform, to perform daily tasks like taking care of your kids or getting to work or school. What happened to you, girl? Why your face looking so? Dog, let me tell you, I feeling so bad and so ashamed. Cause I there are laughing at the girl about her low grades and thing. And I I feeling real bad. But how you think like now that she's back, how you think we can help her with that? We always on our phone, yo. We could call her, we could talk to her as she's normal, we could listen mm. to her, tell her that we miss her at school. Maybe she could share some of what she's going through and if she does we can recommend her to professional help. Mental health is not just an issue here in Trinidad, it's a global issue. So many people are suffering daily and could remain undetected. Globally, we need to become more acknowledgeable about mental health issues. It starts with you and it starts with me. Wherever we are, we should be making a conscious decision to be aware of how important mental health is. It could be the person next to you, it could be you. By helping others, we could maybe help our own self. Gasa, what are you looking for? 
when I find it already, you know, I was actually looking for some ways to, you know, maintain positive mental health. And here's a little list of them, right? So, dog, I think getting professional help if you need it is a great way to start. Also, you can connect with others. You can stay positive. You can get phys physically active. You can help others get enough sleep. You can develop coping skills. You can eat a nourishly dense food. You can eat healthy and nourishly dense food. I think what we're trying to say here, guys, is mental health is a big problem and it takes you and me to make a change. We can all come together and help everyone in this case. Thank you. I am, um, thank you ladies, young ladies and gentlemen for that presentation. I am always delighted to interact with Dr. Shafi and I'm, today I'm also delighted to introduce Dr. Shafi as our featured speaker. I have found him to be a very aff affable gentleman, always polite, always smiling, and, and always so engaging and willing um, because he has been here before, but whenever he comes, he's always um, in the present and he always makes a useful contribution. Now, Dr. Shafi is currently the medical director of the St. Anne's Hospital, a 70-bed hospital and the only psychiatric hospital in Trinidad and Tobago. He is a graduate of the University of Lagos, Nigeria, with postgraduate studies from the University of the West Indies and Institute of Psychiatry, King's College, London. He's a former lecturer in psychiatry at the University of the West Indies. His area of speciality is child and adolescent mental health. He was a member of the Children's Authority Board that operationalized the Children's Authority legislation. He is involved in research with many publications to his credit. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you none other than Dr. Samuel Chaffee. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and I want to extend courtesies to all the specially invited guests, uh, also the leaders, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Archer, uh, Dr. Clark. More importantly, to thank you for inviting me to share my knowledge and experience as a clinician, that's number one, as an administrator, a former lecturer and somebody who is actually actively involved in planning uh, mental health services within the system. Um, just to remind us, I used to be the staff doctor for the University of Southern Caribbean uh, many, many years back. The clinic was by the gate on the other side, right? And also multiple interactions working at the Adventist Hospital. So I've had a relationship with Adventists over the years. So the focus of today's pre presentation, because I've been a lecturer, it kind of allowed me to do the presentation in such a way to more or less address more the students than the people who are very knowledgeable like Dr. Wilson, Dr. Archer, <laughs> Dr. Clark. So, the presentation is actually to answer many of the questions that come to us as clinicians, as administrators, when we have to deal with issues related to mental health. So um, you can put in the first slide. 
So, uh, so today, briefly, I know I have about 20 to 25 minutes. So we're looking at mental health and the challenges that we face. Why is it a global priority? Um, what are the un unanswered questions? Remember Dr. Dr. Clark, Dr. Archer, uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned some of the stigma and the attitude of the general population to mental health. And so I will put out some of the unanswered questions that continue to plague us as service providers within the mental health services. And then we look at way forward and then I will take questions from the audience. So over the years, there's been a movement away from what Dr. Archer described in terms of how we used to see mentally ill people. Uh, remember in those days in the 80s and 70s, the zombie-like presentation of individuals with mental illness. And then the asylum system that existed many years and like Dr. Archer said, whereby in the 90s there was a movement away from large institutionalization of individuals with mental illness. So the current view for mental health is that mental health is the capacity of every individual to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance their ability to enjoy life and deal with challenges. Some of these things have been highlighted by uh, previous people that came on, on the stage. It is a positive sense of emotional and spiritual well-being that respects the importance of culture, uh, equity, social justice, and interconnections, and personal dignity for the individuals. Um, so basically what they are saying is that it's not just about, oh, I'm depressed, or oh, I have anxiety, or oh, I have schizophrenia, that there are a lot of other things that come together and connect together that make an individual to present with mental health problems or mental health issues, as we may say. So we take you back to the view that changed over time from the World Health Organization um, to the statement by Dr. Krisham, uh, the first director general of the World Health Organization, who was a psychiatrist, and, um, and he shepherded the notion that mental and physical health were intimately linked. He famous state, famously stated that without mental health, there can be no true physical health. And then we saw that we were happen with COVID. With COVID, the, there were increases in presentation to all the clinics that we run in Trinidad. Individuals present with depression, anxiety, increase in substance use, just because of COVID. And COVID is supposed to be an infectious disease, not a, considered to be a mental disorder or a mental disease, and yet there's in, interconnectivity between the virus, the symptoms, and mental health presentation of this individual to our clinics. So what then happens when we, don't, we, uh, when we don't have mental health? So these are some of the things you see when we don't have mental health. Unnecessary disability. I know Dr. Acha talked about this as well. Uh, unemployment, substance use, uh, homelessness. I don't need to say much about this. All you need to do is go downtown Port of Spain or go to San Fernando. You see many of the homeless people. All for multiple reasons that are not related to just having mental illness. Multiple reasons that include the absence of the other connecting factors that is supposed to support somebody who has mental illness. Be it social, psychological, emotional, um, maybe um, employment support, um, accommodation support, things like that that are not available for these individuals. As a result of that, they end up on the streets. Uh, inappropriate incarceration, um, that can result from anything, maybe from substance use, 
uh, or from the fact that they are homeless and maybe they, they get into other risky behavior, stealing, uh, get involved in crime. As a result of that, they end up in the, in the um, judicial system. And then you have the suicide. And the poor quality of life that also tends to go along with individuals who have mental illness. And please don't forget, for, for most, some of us that have continued to manage these individuals, it's not just somebody with schizophrenia who will have poor quality of life. For those of us that are administrators, clinicians, we know what it is when staff members call in sick every week because they are depressed or anxious. Or they get to work, we call it presenteeism. You're present, but you're not functioning. So being absent is one. At least I know you're absent. I can, get, I can beg somebody to do your work. But being present and you're basically doing nothing is another thing. Which tends to occur a lot when individuals have the so-called silent, silent mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. Or even the low-lying bipolar disorder, which is we call bipolar two, from the DSM classification system. And then you have the, that goes to a decreased productivity that tend to go along with that. Next slide. So there is underestimated burden. And the reason for that uh, is because of many factors. I will also keep going back because Dr. Archer, um, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Clark just briefly touched on some of these uh, underestimated burdens. Inadequate appreciation of connection between mental illness and other diseases can be, continue to be a problem. Health services are not provided equitably to people with mental disorders. The social barriers are there. Um, I'll just give you an example. Somebody coming to me and saying, okay, um, she's, she came and said, um, I, I feel there's a snake in my, my mattress. So because of that, I carry out the mattress and burn it in the yard. And I said, okay, where do you think the snake is coming from? So I believe it's, it's, um, people are doing obia on me. So those barriers are there, not just the patient themselves who believe in the other things that cannot be explained. And I told her, I said, no, there, are, there may be spiritual factors that could be responsible for mental illness. And I sat down with her, I said, okay, there are things that would separate mental disorder from anything that has spiritual connotation or influence to it. And I did explain that to this individual. And I said, one is, whatsoever presentation you have, let's say the, the mattress you burnt, what were the things that happened before or after, your symptoms, or whatsoever you feel about that mattress, did it prevent you from functioning? Was it persistent? Or was it repetitive? And those are the things you need to be able to make a diagnosis and say somebody has a mental disorder. And that was my... Then there is the issue of budgeting. The budget allocated for mental health care all over the world is very, very minimal. For the same reason, uh, I know Dr. Archer talked about the U.S. In the U.S., a third-party pain system to assess, to assess the social, um, whatsoever is available, whatsoever the government makes available for them to be able to sustain themselves. They wouldn't be able to navigate the system to be able to know what forms to fill, who to go to, so you can't run them all over the place. They end up under the bridge. That's the common thing in the U.S. Unlike in some other domains where they make it mandatory for them to be treated. In Trinidad, we're lucky in that health is free. As a result of that, once you present to the hospital, we don't turn you back. You are admitted, you are treated. But at the same time, we respect your individual right. Once you are stable and it's time to go home, we let you go home. Once you have adequate support at home. So those are some of the factors that come into play and makes the job of 
caring for individuals with mental illness very difficult. Limited research funding for mental health disorders continue to be a problem because we, there are a lot of things we don't understand about mental illness, but we don't have the money to do research, enough money to do research to actually answer many of these questions. And in many instances also, primary health care delivery for the mentally ill is still not as strong as it's supposed to be, even though it's been advocated. And if you look at it worldwide, we still blame the, 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 the medical people, the nurses, the doctors, for their attitude towards mentally ill individuals. Because in Trinidad, there was a time the government attempted to actually incorporate the management of individuals with mental illness within the primary care system so that the doctors in primary care can manage people with depression, anxiety, the minor conditions. But there's resistance from even the doctors and the nurses and individuals who are supposed to have a lot of understanding. Do we then blame those of us in the general public who have the negative attitude towards mental, mentally ill people? And that is coming from the stigma and discrimination that is associated with individuals with mental illness. It extends to even the care, the service providers themselves. Next slide. So let's look at the global challenge in terms of, we just look at epidemiology, just a summary. In the United States alone, one in five adults live with mental illness, and we're talking about 52.9 million. This is a 2020 study. About 14% of global burden of disease has been attributed to neuropsychiatric disorders, especially the chronic, chronically disabling nature of depression and other mental disorders, alcohol use, and substance use disorders. Next. So if you look at what other, in terms of breaking them down as to what is also happening when you talk about disability, uh, the World Health Organization report attributed 31.7% of all years of live with disability to neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, unipolar, unipolar depression accounts for 11.8%. Alcohol use disorder, 3.3%. Schizophrenia, 2.8%. Bipolar depression, 2.4%. And dementia, 1.6%. Next slide. So when you look at all that, we break it down further and look at um, what accounts for deaths. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that neuropsychiatric disorders account for 1.2 million deaths every year and 1.4% of years of life lost. Most of these are caused by dementia, Parkinson's, and ep epilepsy. Taking, for instance, 40,000 individuals die uh, from that for, due to mental disorders, 182,000 due to drugs and alcohol use, whereas 800,000 commit suicide every year, which is almost about a million. Next slide. When we look at Trinidad and Tobago uh, in terms of what has been done over the years, we are quite aware of the, the health system. We do have a comprehensive system for adults in Trinidad. Within that comprehensive system, we have the hospital, the, the psychiatric unit in general hospital setting. We have the at the clinics all over Trinidad. Um, the children's services is still rudimentary and still very limited in terms of service for children. Uh, when we look at uh, data that is coming out of there, when we look at dementia, the recent research from the University of West Indies uh, revealed that some 23.5%, nearly one in four of Trinidadians over the age of 70 have dementia. And also, 25 to 45% of all persons receiving treatment for physical illness in Trinidad and Tobago also have features of depression. And when we look at suicide, let's take a look at the Caribbean. We, we see what was reported by World Health Organization is that 
Two to 2.7 out of 100,000 persons commit suicide in Jamaica. Four to, uh, out of four in 100,000, sorry, in Barbados, and 2.3 to in 100,000 in Trinidad. So Trinidad had suicide rate is higher than what you see in most of the other Caribbean islands. So why is there, because in 2013, there was a changes that actually started with the harmonization of the diagnostic process. And the reason for the harmonization, which actually occurred in the DSM-5 and the ICD, now is ICD-11, is a recognition of the global burden from mental disorders. A recognition that mental disorders actually starts from childhood not from 18. So there is now a graduation from, if you have mental illness from very young, we tend to monitor you as you grow older. That's what we do now. Because in the past, um, we used to look at things differently, where we look at the children separate and the adults separately. But there's a recognition from the different research studies, what is coming out of research, that there's a relationship before, uh, between whatsoever occurs in childhood to what takes, on, takes place later in adulthood. Next slide. So why is mental illness important, or mental health important? Why prioritize it? Uh, it affects how we handle stress, and we could see that from what happened with COVID, because with COVID, many people, we had a lot of people who refused to go to work. Even as we talk, there are people who are still afraid to get out of their house because of COVID. There are people who prefer to actually wear face masks. They will not take out their face masks. There are children who prefer to stay home, as we talk now, and do the online classes because of whatsoever may have taken place during the COVID period. How we relate to each other is also in the, in the society is also important because with mental illness, we talk about impairment because the impairment criteria was what we use, is what we use to make diagnosis. Because you can come with all the symptoms in the world. If you are not impaired, you're normal. Because so, sometimes people will come to us and say, okay, um, I'm hearing voices. Does it mean I'm mentally ill? No, you're not mentally unless you are impaired. I'm seeing things doesn't mean I'm mentally ill. No, you're not mentally ill unless you are impaired. So these are some of the factors, some of the things we have to deal with on a daily basis. And then in terms of, and this affects the choices we make as well. In terms of what we experience, how we feel, affect the choices we make. Either choice of friends, choice of job, choice of relationship, choice of travel, choice of food, and things, these are all affected. Because if you're depressed, then you might be tempted to want to eat continuously to, to more or less fill in the void that exists right there. And then what then happens, you get bigger, you get more problems, uh, image, body image problems, and things that are setting in the process. So your choices also matters when we're talking about mental illness. Next slide. So can a mental illness be transmitted? So these are some of the things the, the layman, the, the person on the street, or even the students will ask us whether mental illness can be transmitted. We continue to shy away from this because as it is, we cannot answer this question. And these are some of the reasons why we still have challenges convincing people about mental illness. So whether it is can, can be transferred, so we don't use the word genetics. So we only tell people it, can, it runs in families. We tell them it's familiar. So if you have a grandfather, grandmother with mental illness, so when you go to a psychiatrist or you go to a doctor, they will ask you the details about your past, your family. The reason they ask that is to see if there's any link between your presenting symptoms and whatsoever may have existed before. As for whether I can take your blood and test whether you have depression and anxiety, no, not at this point in time. That may happen in the next 20, 30 years, but as at now, we can't do that. Now, you do have instances where you can make diagnosis after, after somebody is dead, right? They do, um, 
biopsy, they do um, autopsy of the brain, and then they find different things and say, okay, maybe this person has Alzheimer's, and, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you come with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Can we do a blood test to make a diagnosis? So the, as of now, the answer is no. So what does that tell us? It tells us then that if I have a grandfather who has schizophrenia, I have um, probably a, a sister who has depression. So because I cannot say it is genetic, what then can happen, I can present with a variation to the mental disorder. So I may present with anxiety rather than depression or schizophrenia because of the mixing of the gene that may have taken place. Right? And so the presentation then can vary from one generation to another. Next slide. Can laboratory tests be used to diagnose mental illness? So the answer to that is no. I already answered that. Next one. Next, next slide. Can mental health affect physical health? Absolutely, yes. Uh, depression can come with headache, digestive symptoms, uh, diarrhea. Anxiety can result in upset stomach, insomnia, irritability, difficulty concentrating. Mental health disorders increase the risk for communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, it contributes to intentional and unintentional injuries in many instances. We've had instances where individuals actually burn down their houses or even kill their loved ones, kill their wife, kill their, 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 their husbands, kill their children. And I think we had one recently in Trinidad, a lady, right? All as a consequence, as a risk of a mental illness that is not properly managed or cared for, right? Next. Can someone with mental illness live a normal life? So the answer to that is yes, depending on the type of mental illness. Right, so I will try to clarify that. So diagnosis with mental illness does not mean someone has no future, right? So that's just to follow up on the skit we got earlier on about mental illness. Uh, it takes healthy attitude and appropriate support to achieve optimum self-sufficiency and also following the necessary care. Now, in terms of whether you can live normal life depends on many factors. And then we have different types of mental disorders. And the different types of mental disorders are also come with their different degrees of disability and impairment. So when you're talking schizophrenia, it's quite different from talking depression and anxiety, or even talking bipolar mood disorder. Uh, the chronic, when you go to St. Anne's Hospital, and you see we have 750 patients, most of the patients are patients with schizophrenia. Not depression, not anxiety. So the degree of disability that exists in any patient with mental illness depends solely on the type of disorder that these individuals have. And that is why the image we had at the beginning of time of the psychiatric patient, the mentally ill patient, were more of those associated with patients with schizophrenia who were being treated in those days, not patients with depression and anxiety. Now, you can have severe depression, severe anxiety, but they can still be managed to an extent even without medication. It's just that their productive, productivity will be very low, presentism will be so high, so they are there, they are not functioning, absenteeism will be very high as well for these individuals with anxiety, depression, or even bipolar. Next slide. So can someone with mental illness recover? That's another question we tend to get from the public um, the caregivers, the parents, whether somebody with mental illness can recover. Now, when we talk mental illness, we talk about different factors, biopsychosocial, right? Factors, right? And depending on the factor responsible for the mental illness, it is possible for somebody to recover. If your mental disorder is mainly uh, based on psychosocial factors, rather than biological factors. You are more likely to recover quickly. 
You can have one episode and never have any after that. Let's see psychosocial factors. Let's say you get into an accident, somebody hit you from behind, you, you, you develop PTSD as a result of that, and you never have anything after that. You remain normal for life. The same way with depression. Somebody dies in a family, you, you get depressed, you remain depressed for two, three weeks, and you are diagnosed with depression, and you recover, and you're good for life. So, yes, there are people with mental disorder who can recover, whereas we do have those who may have difficulty recovering. Also, within the context of each mental disorder, we have different levels of severity. So you can have mild, moderate, very severe. So let's say we talk about the schizophrenia. You can have mild presentation of somebody with schizophrenia. And that person will be able to go to work, will be able to do things. The moderate, severe group may be the ones that may have difficulty with going to work, maintaining relationship, or even doing things that we expect them to do. But individuals with mild form of schizophrenia can still function in the society. The only thing is that they may just be loners, they may not maintain relationship for too long, they prefer to be at home by themselves. You put them in front of their table, they stay right there, and they will interact with people around them. Right? But they do their work. They do their work. So, so as a result of that, so we tend to do an assessment and look at the impact and the risk and then make a determination as to what is happening. The new thing that is happening is that we have new drugs coming to the market that is actually now targeting functionality as a main core of treatment, whereby rather than just staying home or being drowsy, sleepy, we want to get the patient functional so that they can do what they are supposed to do. But what we normally do for individuals who are very severe, we tend to focus on the bread and butter day-to-day -day care first. Ability to wake up, know that you need to brush your teeth, you need to bathe, you need to change your clothes, you need to, you know, the basic stuff so that family members don't have to burden themselves with doing that on a daily basis before we graduate to employment, relationship, children, and things like that. Those are the last things on the list. So we focus more on the bread and butter day-to-day -day care for us. Next, next slide. So in, in just to cap it up, mental health affects the quality of life, and as a result of the lack of control, the low self-esteem that goes along with it, the low confidence, a sense of not being part of the society, especially with the society we live in, uh, as a result of stigma and dis discrimination, reduce activity because they tend to stay indoor most of the time, sense of hopelessness, and then the demoralization, the type of comment that the family members will pass, oh, you're mad, something wrong with you. And we do have, as we talk now, in this society where family members still lock family members away from the society, so they don't want people to know that they have family members who have mental illness. So they just put them in a room, lock the door, and just serve them food. That still happens. Next slide. So the takeaway is that there are a lot of unanswered questions about causation, progression, an impact of mental illness which affect attitude towards these disorders. Unless we answer or continue to answer some of these questions, our challenges will continue to persist. And the goal is to be able, through research, to be able to answer many of these questions. Next slide. I think that's the end of my presentation. So I can take questions at this point. Questions from the students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, come. Come. Okay, hold on. Uh, 
All right, so I hear something before about how in countries that have a lower standard of living that like mental health is less there because they're more focused on how they run, get back. Um, in terms of the lower prevalence of mental illness, um, it has been researched and found to be the same thing all over the world um, in terms of the rate. However, as for why you have less people coming to the mental health system in less developed countries, is because of the family cohesion that exists in those countries. So that the families still tend to be intact, more or less directly or indirectly. Or like, unlike in developed countries, where you have fragmentation, there, there's a lot of individualism in developed countries compared to the uh, underdeveloped countries. So that's why you have that rate. Yeah. My question has to do with the point that you made about impairment. You said that a person could be hearing voices or seeing things, but if they're not impaired, they're not, they don't have a mental disorder. Could you expound on that a bit more? So when I first got into psychiatry, the commonest question I used to get is that when I speak in tongue, does it mean I'm mentally ill? And that was the first set of questions in the first two, three years. And the, the point is that the, the, the good Lord is good to everyone in that we have a structural book that guides us on how to make diagnosis. So all the symptoms you see in individuals with mental illness is present in all of us. All the symptoms you see. For those of us that do research, uh, Dr. Archer, <laughs> Dr. Wilson, you know what we call the bell curve, right? So the only thing that separates the mentally ill from the rest of us is that they fall outside the bell curve, outside the two percent. So all the symptoms. Oh, I'm hearing somebody call my name. I see something flashing. That's like seeing things anyway. I smell like I smell something. You know, all those are some of the symptoms. Or have sleeping problem. So they have similar symptoms that normal people have, but the excessive, severe, intense, persistent, and repetitive to the point of impairing their ability to function. So that is why they call them the impairment criteria. I hope I answer your question. Great. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, all protocols observed. I was just wondering, because I know we have a new classification in terms of the DSM-5 or 6 or 7 or wherever we are at. And with this new classification, of course, as far as some persons would say, some researchers would say, it's pulling more persons into the realm on the classification of what we will call mental illness. When really and truly they would know, they, in the past there was no mental illness associated to certain persons. So now that they are now classified as a group of persons belonging to different parts of the mental health disorder spectrum, what does that say in terms of normalization of mental illness? Because it's not mental health, they normally emphasize mental illness. Thank you. Yeah, so that's why they, do, they call it mental, actually it's actual disorder. Like I just said before, is that I said that you're not mentally ill, no matter what you present, you, unless you are impaired, correct? As for the new classification system, pulling people into the diagnosis of having mental illness, surprise, 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 the new system is actually moving in the direction of science, whereby we're now moving in the direction where neuroscience, the findings from neuroscience, is what is going to actually determine in future whether somebody has mental illness or not. And that is what is informing the current classification of mental disorders, either in the DSM-5 or ICD-10. So you are quite, quite right. 
some people are arguing that they are pulling too many people into it. But like I rightly said, you are not mentally ill unless your symptoms impair your ability to function. Are we making sense? So if you go to a, a psychiatrist or somebody and say, oh, I'm not sleeping, I'm hearing voices and all that, then they will ask you, but are you able to go to work? Are you bathing? Are you brushing your teeth? Are you able to maintain relationship? You say normal. They tell you go home. Nobody's going to prescribe anything for you. You're normal. So irrespective of what these instruments do, the instrument also introduced Dr. Acha what we call the, they have the cultural dimension to the DSM-5, telling you that you cannot diagnose somebody with mental disorder unless you know their cultural background, where they're coming from, what their experience is. So there is a cultural pact to the DSM-5 to just escape from what you just highlighted. And for us, we advise that in situations where you think you are not able to diagnose somebody because of their, the cultural factors, you refer them to somebody else who has the same cultural uh, background to, the, the, to those individuals. So rather than labeling somebody as being mentally ill or you mad, you have schizophrenia, but you don't, you don't know where this individual is coming from, send it to somebody who understands them better. It might be a culturally appropriate behavior. Remember, when we sit either in our clinics or in the hospital, when people complain, oh, I didn't ask to be here, uh, nothing is wrong with me, the first thing I tell them is that, oh, I didn't come home to pick you up. Your family brought you. You know why I say that? Your family know what is socially acceptable, Dr. Archer, Dr. Wilson. They know the cultural things that are acceptable. So when you deviate from that, that's the same bell curve, your family will grab you and say, hey, you need help because you're moving away from what is culturally acceptable. So they then bring you by the therapist or by, by the psychiatrist. So you will never end up by no psychiatrist unless your family members recognize that you deviated extremely away from what is culturally acceptable. Somebody here. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, since we, well, these students of CUC are here to become peer counselors, right? My question is, when students or even people outside of our school come to, well, come to ask us in confidentiality about what are their problems, how do we, um, what's the word? How do we keep or differentiate our own mental health problems from their own. So how do we separate? Okay, so the, the, I they... used to be in a university system and what we advise students from upfront is that when we give you the form to fill, you know the, the medical form or even the admission form, they ask you mental health issues. But Dr. Acha, I tell you most of them lie. Is when, when they reach year two, year three, when they start decompensating, that we start picking them up. And they're now asking for either to be waivers and exams, things like that. But if you let the university know upfront what you're going through, the university know what they are going through. The university will support them. That's my answer to that. Excuse me, sir. Good day. Over here, sir. Mm -hmm. Good day. Um, from your experience, could the chemical imbalance that causes mental disorder pass on from mother to child? And if so, is there a way to detect it? I, I know you talk about you can't just do a blood test, but is there a way to detect the amount of chance that a child might inherit those imbalances? Okay, so what these scientists have done over the years is to do something called family studies. Okay? Family studies is whereby you look at the family, twins and, and monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. And what they have found out is that if you have a father who has schizophrenia, you have a mother who has schizophrenia, you probably have almost 75% chance of having schizophrenia, almost 100%. If you have a father who has schizophrenia, a mother who is normal, about 50% chance. So those are the kind of things they found out over the period of time. However, 
However, remember what I said earlier, we cannot do any blood test. We can only say it runs in families. So it runs in family because over the years from the family studies, we realize that your chances of getting any particular mental illness depends on whether other family members have mental illness. But your chances multiply depending on how many of your previous generation have mental illness. Excuse me, sir. Um, I have a question. You said that um, you're taking mental health seriously in schools and these places, and schools have um, therapists on the campus. Support system, yeah. What I'm asking is, with the growing concern of mental health issues within the youth, do you think, or do you think it would be, I don't know how to phrase it properly, do you think that schools should implement a day or a week or so where they focus on the children's mental health per year? Um, I don't, okay, so what, what, what existed at University of West Indy when I was there is that we have the head clinic where individuals can go and talk to the doctor on a regular basis who then link them up with the therapies. So I won't say one day a week or one day, that should be something that is accessible anytime if there are mental health challenges because remember you cannot predict when mental health challenges will come. So there should be a facility where students can go, be the doctor. You start from the general, the general practitioner. Let the general practitioner rule out other things because with us, if you look at the old classification system, before a psychiatrist will see you, we have to rule out medical conditions first. So we start with the GP who will take your history, rule out medical conditions, and then take a uh, necessary step from there. Either to refer you to a counselor, a psychologist, or a therapist. And then remember what I said, psychosocial, so you have multiple support that can exist depending on what is happening to the individual at that point. Right? Thank you. Yeah, there will be no more questions. Thank you so much for your stu students and participants for asking questions. Um, we exceeded our time in regard to questions, so at this time we just want to put a hold on all our questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samuel Sheffrey, for such an enlightening and informative presentation. We, you have definitely shown us that we have come a long way from the stigma that is associated with mental health, yet still we have such a long way to go. And so we thank you for showing us and telling us that without mental health, there cannot be no true physical health. We have seen that mental health does affect the way we handle stress, it affects the way we relate to each other. It affects the choices that we make, and it also affects the quality of life. And so today, as we continue to emphasize our theme, let us make mental health a global priority. At this time, I want to invite Ms. Nasha James as she do a presentation to our main speaker. I just continue to say thanks to Dr. Shafi for your gold mine of knowledge, I think, in the area of mental health. Thank you for enlightening us and for bringing that personal touch in terms of your experience, your professional experience, and also your personal experience to this presentation. I invite you to come to the podium while Ms. Moore presents you with a token of our appreciation.
At this time, I want to invite our specially invited guests as they come and bring to us a small nugget on mental health. We have with us Mrs. Ashvini Nath. She is the manager of the mental health unit of the Ministry of Health, which will be followed by Mrs. Irma Bailey Rez, Interim Supervisor for the Development Assessment and Intervention Unit from the Ministry of Education. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome our specially invited guests. Dr. Wilson, Dr. Archer, Dr. Clark, Dr. Shafi, Ms. Bailey Rez, USC faculty members, specially invited guests, students, a pleasant good morning to you all. So our theme this morning, make mental health and well-being for all a global priority. My question is who gets to do this sacred work? This theme this year reminds me that no matter where we sit in society, that we all have a role to play in raising the priority being given to mental health. So this morning, my short nugget, I want to encourage everyone to do their part. So for those of us who work in the government, it's just a recommitment for us to support vulnerable populations, to promote policies geared towards social inclusion, like the National Mental Health Policy of Trinidad and Tobago, to provide supports for persons across the entire lifespan, to improve access to mental health and psychosocial support services, to monitoring the quality of services being provided, to increase mental health literacy and promote a culture of self and community care, to implement mechanisms for earlier identification and earlier intervention. For those of us who work in mental health care, let us use our outreach activities as a way to proactively serve our communities and increase mental health awareness. Let us recognize the strength it takes for persons to seek our services and remember to create a safe environment that facilitates open communication. Let us treat our clients with the respect and dignity that we would like to be treated with. Let us make every effort to hear the concerns of our clients and involve them in the decision-making process. Let us utilize our knowledge of the evidence-based treatments and practices to give our clients the best chance of recovery. For those of us working in other clinical settings, let us recognize that there is no health without mental health, as was alluded to earlier. The two are so intertwined that they cannot be artificially separated. Therefore, let us advocate for integrating mental health into our treatment noting that health challenges can significantly impact our mental health. And Dr. Shafi spoke about this bi-directional relationship. For our employers, let us understand the importance of creating mentally healthy workspaces. The United Nations notes that workspaces that promote mental health can and do lead to staff who feel that their well-being is supported. The result of such po a positive approach is that staff are more often engaged and productive and this can be done by simply building your skills and knowledge, creating a healthy workplace culture, and supporting individuals in your team who may need some extra support. For universities, include mental health on your research agenda annually. Share your findings, and I know the University of the Southern Caribbean has done a tremendous job as including mental health in their everyday work, uh, and this annual event is proof of that. For friends and family members, take the time to reach out and to listen. Be kind, don't judge. Just sitting with your loved ones who are going through challenges and listening gives crucial support. And for everyone, we all have a mind to take care of, and it is arguably our most valuable asset, as Dr. Clark said. So be mindful of what you feed it. Practice self-care, and as Dr. Wilson said, more importantly, self-forgiveness. We all make mistakes, it's okay. Use evidence-based stress management techniques, exercise, deep breathing, time management, relaxation, get outdoors, eat a balanced diet. Find healthy ways to express your emotions by talking to someone you trust, journaling, pray, get professional help when needed, and finally, be an advocate. Don't discriminate, and let's talk mental health. 
And I like how Dr. Clark puts it, it's your wealth. Mental health is your wealth. Thank you very much. Dr. Wilson, Dr. Archer, Dr. Shafi, Ms. Nat, invited guests, faculty, staff, students. Good morning to all. The Ministry of Education is delighted to partner in every effort which emphasize mental health for children and adolescents. We remain committed to fulfilling the mission of educating learners who will achieve their full potential and become productive citizens. Mental health awareness for our student population is facilitated through the efforts of the Student Support Services Division. However, we all accept that children and adolescents experience multiple transitions throughout their journey to adulthood. They are impacted by a myriad of emotional, physical, and social factors which contribute to their mental well-being or the inverse, mental distress. Increased student exposure to parental discord, to academic underperformance, to interpersonal conflicts among their siblings or peers, poor nutrition, examination failures, physical and emotional trauma has the deleterious effects on the future of Trinidad and Tobago citizenry. These challenges pose eminent obstructions to successful academic and social outcomes. Furthermore, during a climate of a pandemic recovery in which rapid yet novel educational transitions occurred, we saw face-to-face -face learning turn to online learning, then to hybrid learning, then back to face-to-face -to -face learning. These all have short-term and long-term stresses, which have become an undermining aspect to mental health. As the Ministry of Education applies mitigating efforts to these evolving challenges, it necessitates committed partnerships among all stakeholders. We believe there must be enhanced collaboration towards creating effective student and family support systems. Therefore, it demands of all of us to increase programs which support families in their awareness and application of mental health practices. We are to apply avid determination to developing and supporting policies such as Ms. Nat spoke about, which hold persons accountable for endangering children and adolescents' mental health. It requires of us to amplify efforts towards ending stigmatization of children and adolescents living with mental health challenges. It requires of us to apply dedication to support academic and social inclusion for students living with mental health challenges. And it also requires all of us to pay more attention to rapidly advancing research on mental health within a Caribbean context, thereby exploring applications of best practices and interventions that are more relatable to a contemporary Caribbean diaspora. It takes a village to raise a child, and within our village, Trinidad and Tobago, physical and mental health will be valued equally. Thank you. On behalf of the Ministry of Education, we continue to support all efforts in making mental health and well-being a priority.
Thank you, Mrs. Ashvini Nat, Manager for the Mental Health Unit, uh, Ministry of Education, and Mrs. Irma Bailey Reds, Interim Supervisor for the Diagnostic Development Assessment and Intervention Unit, Ministry of Education. Definitely, in order to make mental health a global priority as our theme for today, it is important for us to not, we can't do it alone. And therefore, we need to be able to connect with each other. And so thank you so much for that connection with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education as we continue to work together to make mental health a global priority. Now, I have with me today a, a, a long-time friend. A lo we, we, we were students right on this campus. He was a leader on campus. He's a leader in his home. He's a leader in his community. And he continues to be an advocate for mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we welcome Mr. Ron Christopher, alumni for the University of the Southern Caribbean, as he brings to us a song in example. OK, good morning, everyone. I realize that there are representatives here from, let's say, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education, and as well the university, notable person, so all protocols observed. I would just like to congratulate the School of Social Science on this initiative. My name is Ron Yes, and I'm accompanied this morning by Isaac Patterson. He's a student here at USC. And um, I came to sing Yes, but I need to say this. I'm a couple days away from 40, right? And I want to give this as my personal testimony because I know for those 40 years that um, my mental health has been preserved because of some of the thoughts that I chose to think of, you know, positive thoughts. And one of those positive thoughts is that despite what has happened, the choices I made, the people that rejected me, I believe that God still loves me. And I think that contributed significantly to me being at this mental stage. Health is, can always be improved, right? So I'm not all 100% mental health. Mentally healthy. <laughs> all right, let's get to it. This song, I keep singing it. Lean in. Lean in. Save and secure from all alarms. Thank God I'm leaning. I'm leaning. I keep leaning on. The everlasting arms shooting. When I went my own way, the devil did conspire that I would lose my mind. I found myself facing the fire. You know what lifted me? The everlasting arms of the Savior lifted my mind and meditation. To ground that's much higher Lord you rescued me The depression you saved me from Father Vain is the help of man I trust in you and no other Though the road gets rough or things are smooth It doesn't matter I keep leaning on his arms Yes I'm leaning I keep Leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I keep leaning on his arms. I keep on leaning. I keep leaning, leaning on. The Everlast, there's another song I keep singing all the time too. It's totally different, right? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I have to keep convincing myself. Every day with Jesus, he loves me more and more. 
I remind myself that Jesus saves and keeps me and he's the one I'm waiting for every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before you know someone asked me how come because when the day is done they feel more frustrated than when it first begun everything that should be right seems to be going wrong amidst all this chaos how could they possibly hold on since they've met jesus they tried keeping this law they said huh? I'm more frustrated than ever before. So they asked me, is every day with Jesus really sweeter than the day before? It's all about your mental state, right? So I told them, you just keep thinking. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before don't you give up every day with jesus we should love him more and more jesus saves and keeps me and he's the only one i'm waiting for every day with jesus is sweeter than the day so i said devotion to god should be inspired by love for him you'll get strength for trials from above and first love in him should be priority you'll keep this law eventually love for him helps you overcome sin law listen the father the harder you fight you get sweet victory so though the fight gets hard it gets sweeter for me and that's how every day with jesus will always be sweeter than the day before one more verse listen to this one sometimes i don't realize i don't deserve god's grace and i get upset with god i'm out of place he did so much to set me free died on the cross for you and me and i give up with just a little difficulty remember the light afflictions which we endure here with the weight of glory over there it cannot compare that thought helps me so i believe that every day with jesus will always be sweeter than the day before so I'll end it here. I believe every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. This thought really helps me. Every day with Jesus, I really believe he keeps loving me more and more. And despite what I go through, I believe Jesus will save and keep me. And he's the one I'm waiting for Every day with Jesus Is sweeter than the day before Isaac I feel inspired to say amen. Amen. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And even though we may, we may go for counseling and we may take therapy, we cannot replace hand in hand. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. So let us always remember, even though we're getting help to make mental health a priority, let's not forget the role that God plays in our daily lives. Now I'm going to introduce to you a segment where our students, they are going to tell a story. They are going to share with us their journey and the struggles that they would have faced with their mental health. And it will go in the order of Miss Karina Nanan, followed by Natalia Sam, and then Shakira Frederick. 
after which we are going to have two of our faculty members who would also share their journey with mental health. We will have Dr. Suzanne Chan and Dr. Maria Gomez in that order. Good morning to the University of the Southern Caribbean. Good morning to faculty, staff, but most importantly as well, good morning to those of you who are viewing. This is the 2022 theme, making health, mental health a global priority. So I am no stranger, my name is Karina Nanan. I am from the class of 2016, a proud Yushan. That's right. I belong to the faculty of social sciences, biggest of you all, the best faculty, that's right. A graduate of psychology, but that does not mean just because you graduated from the school, just because you have a degree, that mental health does not pass you by. So I want to share a little bit of my story. First, I want to thank those of you who are here, the faculty in particular, this university for giving people the platform as well as especially invited guests from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, um, Dr. Schaff, who has left, the President, um, and those especially other persons, thank you. So um, my journey, you know, you all could feel free to, you know, if you clap, you could go ahead, you can make noise, that's fine. Um, for those of us, I think we would have seen a significant growth and change in mental health during the pandemic in particular. It has been a tool on everyone. It has not discriminated based on age, socioeconomic background. It didn't matter what country you were from. It doesn't matter. A lot of people saw the increase and the statistics did say that as well. And unfortunately, so did I. So I have been so kindly guided by thoughts of well wishes and you know I want to thank Miss Sadia more even though she was a lecturer of mine many moons ago. Um, she was so supportive. You, you find channels and you find places that you can you know talk to people when you go through these things. So Last year, again, during the pandemic, it was challenging for everyone, as well as myself. And I spoke very openly about my mental health on my social platforms. Um, I'm also a member of the Youth Space of Trinidad. I have a foundation as well, and we try to pledge more support towards young people, mental health, safe spaces, and creating those forums. But I'm going to share a little bit about my personal story with you all. So uh, I did go through depression. I do suffer now and again from anxiety, even though I'm here very, I look very composed, right? Yeah, see, that's, that's how great it is. Um, mental health does not have a face. So just as the kind doctor from the psychiatric ward would have said, some people can go on back and you can go on to contribute and make your contributions, it doesn't, change who you are, it doesn't stop you from making impacts in your own way. But do not for a second think that you should bury how you feel. So again, I'm giving you all, if this is a trigger warning, if these conversations are a bit too dark or it makes you feel a bit sad or you, you feel like you need to step out of your room, that's fine, I'll totally respect that. Just to be mindful as well, there are measures that are available. The university has student support services. The Ministry of Health for Trinidad has fine care TT. There are a lot of networks, right? So at any point in time, if you feel like you need to step out, that's fine, right? So uh, my personal story is I did go through that whole episode of suicidal thoughts. I actually was on suicide watch as well. Um, yeah, I know, right? Wow, this girl, she looks so composed. Yeah. I spoke to my parents, like my mom is here with me today. She's quite in the back. Um, my parents were very supportive during this time, but it was very difficult because you see someone, you go through it, you think it can't happen to anybody. You think that you would 
be able to handle the situation when it happens. But it's okay to reach out for help. It's okay to not be okay. But you don't have to stay there forever. There are means, especially for younger, because I see there's a whole lot of young faces in the crowd today. I'm not that old, guys. I'm 27. Don't, don't feel bad, right? Um, to reach out for help. Don't wait for it to reach that point where you are so dark in yourself that you feel like, okay, then I don't need to be here. You let the depression, you let the anxiety, you let the suicidal thoughts take you over that you end your life. The UN spoke about it. We see it all the time. Doctor shared it on the screen as well that we have very high suicidal rates, especially in Trinidad, because our culture is very driven. We make the jokes. If you go and you watch the memes, there's, it's really funny, yeah? but it's serious that people say, yeah, boy, I might just end my life. And you hear the music sometimes and the songs. And I just want you all to know, please don't take all of those things what you see on social media. Don't take all of those musics. Don't think that suicide is the end option. It is not. So, yeah, um, I really want to advise so many of you to just find safe spaces. I also took the action and initiative of not only through the foundation that I have, which is called the Willow Foundation, to create safe spaces for mental health, but I also did it on my various platforms as well. From um, I'm very involved with work with one of my ministries. Um, I also do it in spaces with my family, loved ones, social groups that I'm a part of. We try to implement the importance of mental health because you don't want it to be that it's too late, okay? Develop coping mechanisms. For me, when I was going through that whole process of you know, thinking I wanted to end my life and I was going through depression, I was, I mean, I look great now, eh? but that's how it goes. You're in your room, you don't want to get up, you don't want to see nobody, you don't want to talk to anybody, you would switch off your phone, disconnect the internet, you will close all your windows, you just don't want to shower, you don't want to eat. I went through it about a year, a year and a half ago. And you don't have to stay there because sometimes you have to reach out to someone for help. It is okay to message a friend. Even if you're in a dark place and you don't want to talk, try to go out. Try to go to a beach, go to a park, go watch a movie. Even if it feels really hard, just send someone a message. Hey, I don't know what's going on, but like, I feel like you know, my thoughts are all over the place. I don't really feel too well. Um, you don't even have to sit and talk, even if you are not in a position, but you recognize that a friend of yours or a loved one is going through that. You can be there by just being present it will help save someone's life because we don't want it to be that it's too late. The message for me from me today to you all is let it don't be too late because you still have time to help save someone's life. So go out there, make the impact, be brilliant changes because this is just a bad day, it's not a bad life. And through God, our university has taught us this, that we are really going to be beyond excellence in everything we do. And put God first, he's going to be able to guide you through everything. Thank you so much for letting me share my story. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Dr. Wilson, faculty, students. Welcome to World Mental Health Day. My name is Natalia Sam, and I'm a third year student majoring in social work. Today, I'm here to share a story with you that impacted my mental health in a serious way. This story involves the loss of my both parents. I was just a little girl around two years old when I lost my mom. I cannot remember a thing about her or what she was like, but from hearing stories from family members and some of her great friends, she was a wonderful person. She cared deeply for everyone around her. Then one day she became ill. She went to the doctor to see what was wrong, and upon doing some tests, she was told she had a brain tumor. She died weeks later. Oh, how I really wished I could have met her. With regards to my dad, I was four months away from writing the CSEC examination when my dad got sick. 
He started getting back pains, and each time these pains grew stronger and stronger. He also visited the doctor and was told that he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. When I heard the alarming news, I cried a lot. As the days goes by, I watched him become more and more ill. He couldn't move and was bedridden most of the time. One day, he couldn't take the pain no more, that he went back by the doctor for some pain medication, and upon examinations again, the doctor informed him that the cancer had spread to his entire body, and he had a few weeks to live. He got smaller, very thin, and was hardly consuming anything. On Sunday the 18th, February 2018, everything changed. I was on my way to church with my guardian, whom I call my mommy, when I got the phone call from his caregiver, letting me know that my dad had passed away. I started to shake, and in astonishment, I said, what? And started to cry profusely. I had lost my best friend, and my world was crumbling down. I urge you guys to take proper care of your mental health. My mental health was impacted through my grief. Losing my parents drastically broke me, and I couldn't control it at some point. To cope, I used to drink a lot of alcohol. Didn't want to talk to no one, and I would refuse to open up to anyone about anything or how I was feeling. And I realized that working for a short period of time, it wasn't helping. And I said to myself, I need to develop better coping strategies. However, I began going to counseling, and through each session I got better. My mental health then was very unstable, but now I can say that I am in a much better place than before. Make your mental health a priority. Take breaks, deal with your grief, cry if you have to. Do what is best for you, and let's make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good day. My name is Shakira Patrick, um, and I'm here to share my story. Everyone has been, has told their stories in such a very systematic way. They had it all organized. And I couldn't do that because I felt as though if I went through that process that I wouldn't be giving you guys the authenticity that I wanted to give you guys today. So I'm speaking from the top of my head. So if you feel it's a little out of sorts, you could laugh, you could do what you want, it's fine. So my story, can I take this off? It's a little stiff. I don't know how to work this. I got it, okay. My story isn't, I don't think it's that remarkable. I don't think it's that um, impactful as the, one who as the girl who spoke before me. But it started when I was young. When I was young, I was often called smart, and it is a compliment. However, after a period of time, the compliment came with shackles, and this shackles binded my self-worth to my grades. So. During primary school, I was going through a hard time. I was bullied, and that took a toll on the way I processed things, on the way I behaved in school. I started to dislike school. I didn't want to learn. And as a result, my grades tanked. And then as a result of that, so did my self-worth, and it just became a never-ending repeating cycle. I eventually grew out of this, but and this is just background information for what I'm about to say. I was not abused physically, nor was I abused verbally. However, I was emotionally neglected. What I mean by this is, I was often told that I was being overdramatic, or I was saying things for attention. And I know some parents do this subconsciously, they don't mean it in a bad way. However, as a growing individual, it really impacted me, especially since I heard my auntie, someone I look up to a lot, say at some point that, oh, she's being overdramatic, she's looking for attention. And that is something that has stuck with me even to this day. Results of that, 
is not something that you can see. It's, you don't really notice it, really, from the outside. But when you think about it and you really sit down, that's when you realize that something isn't right here. For, oh, shucks, sorry. For me, it's anxiety. I'm almost always anxious. I have my son with me, my stuffed animal. Some people have seen me with it on my head, walking around campus, because he helps keep me grounded because of the connection he has with a person who I hold dear to me, my grandmother. Another thing about it is, when you've grown up in a situation where you felt like your emotions were too much or they didn't really matter, or you have this conception that some, you're being overdramatic, like, it's really no big deal, you know? You grow to neglect yourself. You neglect your anger, you think, you put it down, you feel as though the situation isn't as big as it is, even when it is, and this affects you in all sorts. I know I'm being very all over the place, but this affects you relationship-wise as well, not only romantic, but social relationships, in where I'm constantly at a point of insecurity. I need verbal reassurance, I need to know where I'm at with a person, I need to know my place so I won't step out of line. That is a big insecurity for me. Um, Relationship-wise, I have emotionally shut down a lot. It is to a point where for me to feel, it's more of a spark. It's not a, the way how you people describe it, it's more of a spark or it's like a shadow. Like when you stand in front of the light and you're looking at your shadow, it's you but it's not you. That's how it feels for me. So sometimes when I'm with my friends, um, in certain situations, my face will be blank because I'm thinking about how should I respond to this? What is the appropriate facial expression or the appropriate like, emotional response? Because it's, it doesn't really click. Um, I cry, but there are times, at least a few times a year, where I'll be lying down or I'll be doing something and I'll just cry and I don't know why I'm crying. I don't understand why I'm crying, but I'm crying. And that indicates to me that something is wrong, but I don't know what is wrong because I don't understand, well, I do understand my feelings, but I don't understand why I'm feeling this way. Even now, in the back of my head, um, there's a little voice telling me, you shouldn't be up here. This is for people who are really going through things, that I'm being overdramatic. It doesn't count. This is just regular issues everybody goes through. But it's something that, it's subtle, but this is deadly, and you shouldn't ignore it. Your feelings are valid. Being able to say no to a situation does not make you a bad person. Being able to not identify how you're feeling in the moment is not a bad thing. Expressing yourself is not a bad thing, regardless of whatever the situation says, whatever it is your friends say, because I know your friends sometimes will be like, oh, it's no big deal. You're just being overdramatic. If it's important to you, then it is important. And don't let anybody diminish that importance. That's all I wanted to say. I'm so sorry. Good morning to each one of you. All protocol observed. Um, so here am I to tell my story. Um, I listened very carefully to all the stories that has been, you know, related. And I really appreciated the song that Ron sang. I could, you know, relate so much to that song. And I do sing also in my heart, not publicly. <laughs> Make up my own thing <laughs> and uh, sing. So I want, in my story, I just want to give a little bit anthropological twist because I'm an anthropologist and uh, tell you about how culture plays a role in the way our mental health is shaped, okay? It has a lot to do with our up upbringing and every one of the students that they related, they related to the family, they related to the upbringing, they related to their support that they got from the family. So my story, I want to take you to down the memory lane 
and I thought I will share with you pages from my early childhood and my experience in a school. Some of you did speak about your school experiences. So here I was studying in an all-girls convent school in an elementary level, and the kids were very inquisitive in that, uh, in, in about their schoolmates. And uh, while on the playground, I was very good with sports and games. I, I played throw ball, basketball, rugby. I was very good with sports. But I was also fielding questions from my peers. And uh, we were like seven or eight years old, very young. And I never knew about stress and mental health and all those things never bothered me at all. Of course, young children was never worried about those things. But when I look back and I think about the questions I was asked, I want to share the three questions, something that they always ask me. What do your parents do? And I say, okay, my father is a lab technician. What is that? Oh, he tests blood. Is he a doctor? Kind of. <laughs> I did not want to say exactly which level in the medical field he is. And uh, I say, my mom is a nurse. And so that took care of my economic part of it, to say that, okay, well, I'm from a pretty good family. The second question they would ask me, what is your caste? Now, if you know, coming from India, caste is such an important thing. So they'll ask me, they wanted to know what's your caste. And I never knew how to explain that because I came from a tribal community. And in India, in, in, in the circles that we were in, we were called as Adivasi. Adivasi means Aborigines. And it was like, okay, you are forest dwellers, and um, you live in the jungle, you live in the forest, and the, the concept about people coming from tribal background was very low. So I did not know how to answer the question, and so I said, well, I'm a Santhal. That's the name of my tribe. <laughs> so let them figure it out, what, what is that? So I say, um, I don't know about my caste, but I know I'm a Santhal and I was proud about that. Then the third question they would ask me is, what is your religion? And I said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, what is that? And I'm an eight-year-old, okay, I was just a young child. Oh, we go to church on the seventh day, that is Saturday, and they couldn't figure it out because they knew church is always on Sunday, and the school that I went to was a Roman Catholic school. So I said, I'll let them figure it out. <laughs> so well, I answered all the questions truthfully because that was the fact. And my parents taught us from our childhood who we were. And we had a unique situation of being the only Seventh-day Adventist family in the entire community and the company hospital where my parents were working. And uh, we always felt that who we were, we were normal. And even though our lifestyle was different from the rest of the community, we were well accepted. So from our early childhood days, parents taught us that it is normal to be a Santal because we come from a tribal community and we haven't come here overnight. My parents lived you know, in the cities, they had their education and all that. And so they told us, this is our background. We come from a Santal community and they taught us about our culture even though I never learned my language, my dad spoke the language, and uh, so we didn't, I didn't learn the language. So that was our lifestyle growing up. And they also told us who we were. We are Seventh-day Adventists, though as a young child I didn't understand. But they told us, and the more we understood, and people asked us these questions, and we told them who we are. And so that's how my life went on. And I, it made me to realize that socialization in our homes and families really shape our ways and perception of our world. And children learn what is normal. And they learn to accept that very early years in life. So children are taught that is okay, or that is normal, or something is not normal. So another aspect in my life was, I grew up as a left-handed person, was another aspect in my life. And I accepted it and moved forward. I was left-handed, not by choice, but I had a deformity on my right hand, the way that I was born, that didn't, I couldn't use my right hand for anything. So I adapted my left hand to do all my work. And my parents treated me, I mean, no different. And I grew up as a normal child, left-handed, and people did ask me, and I say, 
It's just normal thing, a part of me. I never thought that it was something different or weird, but I just used my left hand as normal. But of course, there were things that I couldn't do. There was passion in my life. As a young kid growing up, I always wanted to learn classical dance. The Bharat Natya, my friends used to go to those musical and classical dance classes, but I couldn't go because I couldn't use my hands, you know, the motions and stuff like that, or play a musical instrument, which my brothers did. They learned guitar and they play very well, but that didn't cause me to stress myself because I was good in certain things. I could play basketball, I was in a team, and I could sew, I could knit, I could crochet. So those were some of the things I was good in doing. And so that helped me keep abreast with myself and move on in my life. And that doesn't mean to say that I, have, um, I don't have issues with my mental health. There are times I can be distressed, there might be lows in my life. But over the years, I have learned that if we focus on things that we are good at, you, or you, you feel so much self-gratified by that, and it helps you to move ahead in your life. So thank you uh, for listening to my story. And I have this encouragement. This week, I've been sharing with my class, 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here this morning, and when I was asked um, to present today, I wondered, how come I was asked? Because I'm going through a lot of stuff right now. So maybe somebody knew that. So I want to thank um, the coordinators, as well as acknowledge um, the dean and um, the other uh, persons, the president, etc., who uh, just left, and the provost, and of course the students, and, um, and the online audience. So, having said that, the theme for today is make mental health and well-being for all a global priority. So, as I said, I wondered, what should I talk about? What should I present about, you know, when there's so many issues plaguing us at this time. And of course, because it's personal stories, I had to, you know, go into the personal piece. And so I'll present very briefly on how I'm managing to maintain balance. I'm a social worker, I lecture in social work, and what we talk about as homeostasis or equilibrium and that's what I'm trying to maintain right now in terms of my mental health, right? So, you must be wondering, what is the context? She's taken too long to come to what is the context. So, I want to let you know that I play several roles. As I said, I'm a lecturer, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a sister, and I'm a daughter. So, I want to focus today on being the daughter. So my role as the daughter, why do I want to focus there? And it's because at this time, I have to compartmentalize a lot because my mother is gravely ill and I'm here. And I have to work and I have to compartmentalize and do all these different things. Um, so how do I feel? How do I feel every day when I have to come up to USC, like today when it's raining a lot and people are calling me saying, you, you're going up and it's all this rain. And I said, no, I'm supposed to be there and everything will be fine. But generally, I feel powerless, I feel fearful, I feel helpless and frustrated because as I said, I'm losing my rock. So how do I manage? It's been mentioned already. And since I'm the last speaker, I'll mention it again, self-care. So self-care is important. What do I do in my frustration that I watch somebody dying and I can't do anything for them? I have to reframe. 
I have to see the glass half full instead of half empty. There are many rational thoughts that come about, and they can put you in this cycle of fear. These thoughts make me anxious, and as a social worker, I have to step outside myself because I'm playing so many roles and say, you know what? Let me be a witness to myself. Could you imagine that being a witness to yourself, stepping outside yourself? And so in doing that, I have to breathe, all right? The irrational thoughts that come to my mind, I identify them. So I'm coming up to school this morning and the rain is pouring, it's flooding and I'm saying, I wonder if I'll be able to get back home because maybe a tree will come across and I'll have to spend the night up here. So that's an irrational thought because once we rely on our higher power and that's what I've had to be, um, be doing all the time, all right, then I can change the irrational thought. So I replace that irrational thought with a helpful alternative. I reframe the thoughts as Albert Ellis, anybody doing psychology will know I reframe those thoughts. And I live by that. What can I do? Well, I like to go to the beach. But the weather these days, you could never tell. So when the rain is falling, I could step out in the rain and I could say, well, you can't get the water from the sea, but I could get the water from the sky. And I stand in the rain and I'm thankful because we have life and we have to be thankful. And I have to sing um, to myself, but I also sing to my mother. And what I sing to her reminds me of how I have to be in this whole time. So, I just want to close off since we're wrapping up things. I may not be able to sing like my friend across there. And I have to get that song, right? Because it's very helpful to me when you're singing it. So I'll leave you with this song. And, and then I have to get that music musician at some point. We have to get acquainted, right? And this is a little quote by somebody called Stephen Levine. And it says, grief is love with no place to go. Grief is love with no place to go. And so my mother, and that's like my world right now, right? So I'll just do this song in closing. And I will say as well, while I find the song, I have to remind myself and I think that my being at USC since January is not by accident. I think it's divinely ordered because I don't know if I'd have been able to survive, all right? So just as I, in class, have to bring the spirituality to the students, I always find things that will help me as well. And, and this particular Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And so I hold on, not sure for how much longer, but I hold on and I rejoice that every day my mother is still here, um, that we have her still here with us. So this is a song that I sing to her because she asks, how much longer do I have to hold on? I'm in pain. And this just came up on my phone. So I have a smartphone and the tune came up and I learned it, right? And I'll play it here and I'll try to sing it. In his time In his time He makes all things beautiful in his time Lord please show me every day as you teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time in your time, in your time, you make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life I bring 
Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time, in your time, in your time. You make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life I bring to you. Make each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. In each day a lovely thing in your time. Thank you very much. That's how I deal with my mental health right now. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your story and for allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough to share your challenges with your mental health. You know, about a year and a half ago during the pandemic, um, I, had, I had an ex encounter where, for no reason whatsoever, I was just feeling emotional and I just want to cry. And I'm thinking to myself, but nothing is going on in my life that requires me to feel sad and to cry this way. Like, why am I feeling this way? And I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm feeling emotional. And a friend called me and I shared what, I was like, I don't know what's going on with me. Something is wrong. And a friend of mine said to me, said, Usha, you have not gone anywhere since this pandemic. You have stayed in this house. It's four walls. You have you've just been by yourself, not associating with people, not going anywhere, not allowing anybody to come home. Maybe you need some social contact. Maybe you need some fresh air. And what I'm saying to you is that choose people who are good for your mental health. You need a good support system in your journey. We all have battles and we all have struggles. And at some point in time, we're going to need someone to say to us, hey, let's go for a drive. Let's take a fresh air. Let's take a break. Because we, at some point in time, we all need a mental health break. At this point in time, I want to invite our the university counselor, Ms. Shanice Phillip, and she will provide you with some suggestions on how to improve your mental health. Ms. Shanice Phillip, which will be followed by Dr. Edward Clark, the Dean of the Social Science Department, and he will do a special presentation on behalf of the social sciences. Ms. Shanice, put your hands together and welcome Ms. Shanice Phillip. Good afternoon to everyone who is here today. So my task today is a, a brief one, just to build upon what we have already received from all of our presenters and all of the members who shared today. It's just some quick tips about how to, basically some coping strategies that can help you deal with your mental health. Additionally, it's an opportunity for you to let me know if there is anything that you think the university can do or can contribute to building a safer mental space for all of you that are here. So first, I'd like to introduce the counseling department of the university. It is located downstairs, Larry Lister. Counseling services are available for all students. You do not have to pay additionally for it, and there is no limit to the amount that you can get. You can have your sessions in person, or you can have your sessions online. You can access the counseling department by sending us an email to counseling services at USC dot the rest of the email, and just letting us know that you would be interested in conducting having a session, and we'll send you all of the information that you need after that to have a session conducted. Now, some very simple coping strategies or some simple tools to help you 
manage what you may going, be going through on a daily basis is first just some self-awareness. A lot of people came up here today and spoke about feeling a bit off or not feeling quite well, but not quite knowing what was going on or what they were feeling. One of the first steps of addressing your mental health is being aware of where you are, being aware of what your mental health is. So that means that you need to take time to check in on yourself on a semi-regular basis. Am I doing okay today? That person that I got angry with, was I angry with them or was there something else behind of that? I was a bit irritated at everybody today. Why was that? I'm not feeling as happy and peppy as I usually am. Why is that? Taking those moments to reflect in and check in on yourself is going to be the first indicator, your first tool in understanding your mental health because you're paying attention to it, right? And after you've taken that time to pay attention to it, what you're now going to do is what I like to call developing a mental health toolkit or a stress management coping mechanism toolbox. And your toolbox should be filled with quick stress relievers and long-term stress relievers. And these are things initially that you should be doing before you get overwhelmed or before you get stressed. So what you're going to do is you're going to find activities that help you feel refreshed, that help you feel renewed, help you feel your normal. So this might be things like singing a song when you're feeling overwhelmed, talking to a friend, watching a movie, going outside in your garden, going to the beach, right? Things, and these can be long-term and short-term. Short-term being things that you can do in the moment, quick. Somebody tells you something and it's a little irritating, you're like, hmm, you're gonna start humming that song to yourself immediately because you know that song helps you bring those stress levels down. And then you're gonna have long-term stress relievers, which are things that you can do habitually throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your month that help maintain a certain level of stress or a certain level of balance with you. Because I'm sure as we would have gathered today, we've realized that avoiding stress and certain things, it's, it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. So what we want to do when we're taking charge of our mental health is to make sure we're keeping those stress levels at a place where it's not impairing your ability to do what you need to do throughout the day. So your long-term stress relievers could be things like going and getting your hair done, could be things like taking a long drive, planting a garden and watching your vegetables grow. It could be things like giving yourself a spa weekend. It could be things like going to the movies, or planning a long-term social event with your friends on the weekend. These are things that you might not be able to do all the time or things that take more energy and take more time from you, but doing them in regular intervals and integrating them into your lifestyle helps you maintain a lower level of stress, right? So what we want to do when we're doing, when you're building your toolkit is personalize it to yourself. You have to know what helps you feel relaxed, what brings, you, what brings your stress levels down. And you just wanna make sure that those coping mechanisms are things that are healthy, meaning that they don't have long-term negative consequences to you. So for example, a healthy and unhealthy coping mechanism could be something like going to the gym. I know, how can that be unhealthy? But if you're going to the gym to a point where you're pushing your body past its limits, you're hurting yourself and your muscles, you can't function at all during the day if you haven't gone to the gym and you haven't done these things and you feel like you're going to break down, going to the gym has now become an unhealthy coping mechanism because it's going to have negative long-term consequences. So when you're picking what your coping mechanisms are going to be, you want to make sure that they don't have negative long-term consequences to you. And once you've taken time and you've filled your toolkit with your quick stress relievers and your long-term stress relievers, now it's time to use it. You'd be surprised or not surprised how many people know what they can do to relieve their stress, but say, I'll do it later. I have all of these things to do first and I'll do that part later. No, do it now, right? It is a priority and you have to recognize it is a priority in your day to day. And if you don't make it a priority, when you fall apart, everything else that is dependent on you functioning will fall apart after you. Everyone who is dependent on you will not be able to receive your help because you haven't taken care of yourself. So make yourself a priority, understand and be aware of what creates stress or what creates those moments in you and use the tools that you have available when you've created your mental toolkits to manage your stress and keep those stress levels down. Now, 
I was also tasked quickly just if there were any additional questions or queries that may have any suggestions that you may have or what you think the university might offer, I'll do my best to answer. Yes. Yes, I will take your information after so we definitely can start seeing if there's something that we can do in that regard. Did anyone else have any questions or queries about what I quickly shared? All right, it's been a long day. Thank you for your attention. I'll invite the next presenter up to continue. All right, good. As we bring the curtains down on World Mental Health Day, I want to wish each and every one of you a happy Mental Health Awareness Day. In fact, I want to say a happy Mental Health Semester to you. So let us never underestimate the importance of good mental health. A person who is mentally healthy has the power to face all kinds of challenges in life. So I encourage you to make your mental health a priority. Prioritizing your mental health is essential to your overall well-being. And so when we started this morning, I asked you to turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, your mental health is a priority. So now I want you to turn to your neighbor as we end and say, my mental health is a priority. So I want to wish you a very happy Mental Health Day. As we bring the curtains down, as I said, I want to invite Ms. Nasha James. Ms. Nasha, she is the a lecturer, if a, a, a instructor, sorry, in the Department of Psychology, Criminology, and Criminal Justice and Behavioral Sciences. She will do our vote of thanks, which will be followed by closing prayer, Mr. Clyde Bez, the coordinator for the Behavioral Sciences degree program. Now, before Ms. Nasha James come on, this would be, these are the events that would follow. We have Dr. Edward Clark, and he will do a pre special presentation on behalf of the Social Sciences Department. So while Dr. Clark makes his pre special presentation, I'd like for the, the, all the lecturers and um, instructors that are present from the Social Sciences Department, um, to come forward and provide some assistance as he does the unveiling. Thank you. As you know, it's all well and good to have programs and we leave, but we want to show commitment. We want to show commitment to World Mental Health Day. And what we are going to do, we have decided that as a School of Social Science, that we are going to establish, as from today, a mental health well-being board. Could you unveil it for us, please? It's a very basic board, nicely decorated. Um, so I just would give a round of applause. This is an uh, initiative of Ms. Moore and her team. And on this board, every day we are going to put a quote uh, item of importance something that will enhance your mental health. Something that will enhance your mental health. So you can go back to your class and you can set up a mental well-being board in your classroom 
I'm talking to the students, and you can put up a little clip of something that you think would be good for the mental health of your particular class. Can you do that? Good, and then I'll come around to your class and see it. So we have this initiative, and we are hoping that other schools will take this initiative and run with it, because our mental health is absolutely critical. Critical, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, if you don't have good mental health, then you have no health. So uh, this is the board that we're going to launch. If you see it on, in, as you pass through the corridors in the School of Social Sciences, you will see this and it will have, you can stop and you can read what's up there. If you want to put something on that board and you're not a member of the School of Social Science, a faculty member or staff, I will ask you to go and see Miss Moore, the lady with her hand raised, and, that, and she will take it from you and put it on the board, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And now we, want, we have introduced mental health wellness board. Thanks. Are you all cold? I'm cold. Let's stand up. And you know this is COVID time, but we can still do an elbow, what, knock? <laughs> elbow bump? <laughs> Give somebody an elbow bump, do a little stretch. Give someone a smile. Move about a little bit, and you can sit now. My task, which is really not a task, but just a privilege, is to thank all of the persons that would have made this program possible. I'm so proud of the secondary school students, the peer counselors, who actually stayed throughout the program. Thank you all so much. We know that adult stuff can be boring, but we are very grateful that you all stayed. The first person I want to give thanks to, of course, as I go through the list, is God. You know, usually he's the last on the list, but in my life and in our lives, he should be first. Because without him, we would not have life and we would not have any health. So we thank God. We thank God for all that he has done and for making this program possible. Of course, we thank our keynote speaker who has left, but we thank him in his absence, Dr. Samuel Shafi, who is the medical director of the St. Anne's Psychiatric Hospital. We also thank our special guests, who are still here, Mrs. Ashvini Nath, is it Nath or Nath? Nath, yes. Manager of the Mental Health Unit at the Ministry of Health. We thank Mrs. Irma Bailey Rehis, Interim Supervisor, Developmental Assessment and Intervention Unit at the Ministry of Education. Thank you both. We thank our other invitees, some of them have left, um, Dr. Mrs., sorry, Victoria DeCoto, the health director of the South Caribbean Conference. She was here. She has left. We thank Ayana John, who is here, and a very enthusiastic advocate for community development. We thank you for being here. She is the assistant director of health education at the Ministry of Health. We thank the persons that were also a part of our platform, although we didn't literally have a platform. The president of the university, Dr. Khan, the provost of the university, interim provost, Dr. Len Archer. And of course, we thank our dear dean, Dr. Clark, the dean of the School of Social Sciences. To all of the faculty members, all of the students, our dear students, my class was here, most of them left, but they stayed until 12 o'clock. You know, I thank you all so or two special guests, special, special guests. We invite um, Mrs. Asvini Nash to the podium, and we also invite Mrs. Irma Bailey Rehis.
Dr. Clark, can you come forward to present it to them, please? Thank you all. Thanks again for being here. Unfortunately, Mr. Best had to leave, so I will be doing the closing prayer. Shall we bow our heads for prayer, please? Kind and merciful Father, we do thank you for life. Thank you that we are alive and that we are able to be here and receive this special and important message on our mental health. I pray that you bless and help everyone in this room and those who are watching virtually, that they may take care of their mental health and that you will give us the ability and bless our mental faculties, bless our emotions and give us the mindset to be able to understand and recognize when we need help and be proactive and work towards it. This is my prayer of thanksgiving in this prayer press special name of your son Christ Jesus we pray amen thank you I, I, I think it would be remiss of me to close without extending considerable and embracing thank yous to Miss Sadia Moore and the team Putting this together is not an easy task, I promise you. So, Ms. Moore, um, Dr. Hinkson, who had to leave on an emergency, Mrs. Narsha James, Mrs. Ramla Khan, we thank you so much, and all the assistance that you had Ms. Abaka, and I'm sure I'm leaving out someone, but everyone else, we want to thank you so much. It's an idea, but then translating the idea into action calls for a lot of energy and commitment. So thank you all very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Bye-bye.